All the recordings in progress. So yeah, I almost forgot. I almost do that every time. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys for being here and I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon. <clears throat> Uh, all right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Um, lay down, Irish. Down. The dog's like, why are you standing? Um. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um. Thanks for having me back. Um. This um, presentation is about guide dogs, what they are and what they do, and um, what are some of the barriers experienced by guide dog users. Um, um, next slide. Um, and so I guess I could, I could just run through my agenda really quickly is just basically who I am and what a guide dog is and a little bit about guide dog programs and stages of a, of a guide dog's life and what the training is like for a guide dog user and a guide dog. <laughs> um, and what, what does a guide dog do for a user? And um, what do they do in the workplace? Which of course depends on the workplace, but um, what do they do at home? And barriers, a little bit about barriers faced by guide dogs, and then um, some of the legal protections and what businesses can ask about guide dogs, and uh, what are the responsibilities of a guide dog user, and then a little bit time for questions. Um, so again, thanks for having me back. It's awesome to be here. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Shannon Dillon. I'm president of the California Association of Guide Dog Users, which is um, a division of the National Federation of the Blind of California. Um, it's an entity um, that, that's part of a, a bigger national organization, uh, the National Federation of the Blind. So we're just a, a little California chapter that's uh, specific to guide dogs. Um, the, um, my guide dog is Irish. She's a she's a German Shepherd. She's an eight year old German Shepherd. She's from the Seeing Eye. The Seeing Eye is one guide dog school. Um, and so, as, as we'll talk about, there are a number of guide dog schools. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, what's a guide dog? A, a guide dog is a type of service dog under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, service uh, service animals are defined um, defined as dogs that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. And examples of work work or tasks includes gui guiding people who are blind, alerting people who are deaf, pulling a wheelchair, alerting and protecting a person who is having a seizure, um, reminding a person with uh, mental illness to take prescribed medications, calming a person with um, post-traumatic stress disorder um, during an anxiety attack or performing other duties. Um, next slide, please. And the link for that is on this coming slide. Um, so um, guide dogs, um, sorry, service animals are working animals, not pets. Um, and the worker task a dog has been trained to do um, must provide, uh, must be directly related to the person's disability. Um, dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support don't qualify as service dogs, as service animals under the ADA. And then um, I provided the link for the, for the information I, um, uh, where you can go look at the information I provided. Um, so my dog, I'm blind and my dog is trained to guide me. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how and where are guide dogs trained? Um, there's, uh, it seems like every time I Google it, there's a different number of guide dog schools, but there are around 15 guide dog programs in the United States. And there's a couple in Canada and of course, there are international um, schools. Um, the schools have different ownership policies, 
for the for the user you know when do you own the dog some like a seeing eye you get it after you graduate from the training program so you go for um either two or three weeks of training to whether depending on whether you're a new user or a returning user and um after you graduate from that training program your dog is yours other programs wait for one or two years till you officially own your dog um, they also have different puppy raising policies, like whether you can be in touch with your puppy raiser or not. The puppy raiser is the person who has your dog for the first, I think it's like about a year of its life. And it, um, they teach it sit, stay, they teach it house behavior. Um, well, teach it just behavior in public, get it used to being around people, socialization. And so those, um, some schools allow you to have contact with your puppy raisers, some don't. Um, some do if both parties agree, the puppy raiser and the user agree. Um, they also have different training methods. Some um, focus on food rewards more, others um, focus more on praise and correction um, or just praise and telling the dog, no, you know, you're wrong. Um, my, I was not a food reward, I, my school, you, you can learn to use food rewards with the clicker trainer, uh, with the clicker, but generally um, it's a praise and correction. Um, so I don't have to carry around a bait bag with food to, to help my dog. And that's just my preference, but, um, but obviously food reward, rewards work really well. Um, uh, I did say there are international guide dog schools um, and there's an international I always get the words all mixed up. International Guide Dog Federation provides training standards for guide dogs worldwide. And I think most schools uh, follow those guidelines. Um, next slide, please. Um, stages of a guide dog's life. So these stages I took from the CNI.org, the CNI but unfortunately, like they've just rebuilt their webpage. So I um, couldn't find the exact document that, but this information generally comes from them. So the first stage is the puppy uh, um, is named and um, it's born, it's named. Um, they explain, they start in October with the letter A and they, you know, so the first litter will be named the A litter, the next litter will be a B litter, then a C litter. And they may go through the alphabet twice sometimes before they get to the uh, next October and then they start over again with the letter A. Um, that's, that's for seeing eye. Um, rules for names, um, they um, can't sound like a command. So commands are like forward, left, right. And um, they, they can't have a negative connotation. Um, at four weeks, the puppies go to the playroom where they experience stairs, replicas of curbs, train stations, astroturf. I think, I believe I've read they hear, hear like traffic noises. They kind of start learning about all the kind of environmental stuff they're going to have to deal with when they're working. Then at stage two, they go to puppy raising around eight weeks. They go to a puppy raiser to learn socialization and basic obedience. Um, at stage three, um, they get trained. Um, at about one year, the dog goes to the campus to be trained with a, a sighted instructor, learn to be a guide dog. Um, they train for about four months. When the dog passes, it's matched with a blind person. And um, the dog and person train together under the supervision of the instructor. And then stage four for the dog, is um, when that dog is, has its career and it works as a guide dog for the blind person. I'm using blind in this context. I'm just gonna tell you that I, I put blind a lot, but it's blind or low vision. Um, you know, it means legally blind. So I'm just kind of incorporating blind, low vision, whatever into, into blind. Um, st stage five is adoption or retirement. So the, the dog is done with its career. Some people choose to keep their dogs when sometimes they retire and go back to the school or go back to live with their um, puppy raiser. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what is training like for a guide dog user? Um, well, first of all, you have to apply for the guide dog. There's like an online application. You have to share medical information and tell how active you are and how 
what are your any any physical limitations you have um the school comes to visit you they it seems like now they want videos of you to see how you travel and they want to make sure you know how to cross the street and what your pace is and what your lifestyle is like um, they, you may need a recommendation from an orientation and mobility instructor. They need to, they need to know that you can travel independently without a dog, um, that you're able to independently get yourself around before you can get a guide dog. Um, let's see, once the person, so then the person gets accepted to the program. And then you wait for, it seems like forever till they match you with the dog. I didn't put this part in here. I just realized matching is a huge thing. They try and find a dog that matches your personality and your speed and your lifestyle and any other preferences you have, if you have a specific breed or um, color preference. Um, so I, I don't know, I've waited a couple of years for a dog before. I don't, I don't think that's a unusual. Um, training so then the training with the guide dog can occur in a residential program or at home um so let's see training in a residential program is where you actually go stay at the campus of the school or of the training program um that's primarily how cni trains you go stay at a dormitory you have your own room but you stay with other students for the two to three weeks that you're there to train um, then there are other schools who provide in-home training um, where the instructor comes to you and provides the training in, in your home and in your community. Um, I did my first guide dog that way. And that was, um, that was actually those awesome. I, I don't know. They both have benefits. Um, next slide, please. Um, So the training, I said that lasts from 14 to 28 days, depending on the residential or depending on the program. Um, often you go in with a team, like in some schools, you go in with a team of, you'll have one instructor per one to two or three people, I think. That's, that's been my experience. I, um, I've only I've been only been to two schools, and so I'm sure there are schools that are different. Um, but um, you go and work with a, a team and with one instructor. Um, we talked about the different training methods earlier. Um, if a person completes it, so I, I'll give you a schedule of the training. It's pretty, it can be pretty rigorous. It's very, um, it's very like you have, it's very structured. Um, and once you complete that training, then you graduate and you continue to work, work the dog until it retires. Um, the person, you know, you might be able to have follow-up services, like if you're having problems with your dog after you leave the school, you know, once you've um, come back to your community and you're working or going to school or whatever, if you have some kind of issue with your dog, you can always call and get services. And usually they work try and work it through you with, over the phone or they may have to come out. Um, then retirement, when the person and the school decide that it's time for the guide dog to retire, you retire it and either keep it or it may go back to the school or to its puppy raiser. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's a typical schedule, at least in my experience in a residential program. I know they're not all the same, although from what I've heard, they're pretty similar. Um, so at 5.30 a.m., you get up and take the dog to the bathroom, and then you feed it. Um, and then at 7 a.m., you go to breakfast. You kind of all hang out in the lounge or in your room or whatever, and you wait until you get called to breakfast. And walking to breakfast, um, they, like, put stuff in the hallway to try and distract your dog. They're trying to, um, especially the, you know, the longer you've been there, they want to distract your dog and see if it's going to go after food that they sneak out in the hallway or if it goes after the cats. At least C and I has a couple of cats and their sole job is to just uh, see what, <laughs> make sure the dogs don't respond to the cats. Irish always responded to cats and she still does, but whatever, she still responds to squirrels too. Um, but um, so the food and the cat distractions, 
So anyway, you have your breakfast in the cafeteria. Um, you have your own chair. They, you sit at a table in groups, but you have a chair you go to for like a week. And this is so that your dog starts learning to take you to your chair. And you'll change chairs a few times while you're there. But the point is to have your dog learn to take you back to a chair. And that becomes important later for when you're in school or at work, your dog, you know, so when you come back into a meeting room or you come back into your classroom or you go to the bathroom at a restaurant, your dog can bring you back to um, your chair. Um, so you go to breakfast at seven, at eight to 12. Uh, there's usually a trip to downtown, uh, downtown in the working area in the community where you learn, you know, crossing streets, um, doing curbs, up curbs, down curbs, um, where you uh, run into, you know, revolving doors, escalators, all the trains, buses, they want you to make sure you can work through all these situations with your dog. At 1130, you come back to school, you take it to the bathroom, at 12, you eat lunch, one o'clock, you back go back downtown and do the same work again for the afternoon in the community. At 4.30, you take your dog to the bathroom and feed it, and five is dinner. And six, there's often a lecture. Um, sometimes you're free until eight, but often there's a lecture on um, grooming, feeding, um, maybe clicker training, if you chose to do clicker training. Um, different, you know, health related issues, um, the, the importance of obedience. Um, then at eight o'clock, you take your dog to the bathroom and um, then that's it for the night. You're free until you get up at 530 the next morning <laughs> um, and it starts all over. Um, so home training, the schedule is a lot different because it's developed by you and your instructor. And so I, um, you know, you pretty much do what works for you and your instructor in your community. It's just one person, one instructor. Um, some of the residential programs do allow, um, under certain circumstances, people to be trained in home, but I think the primary focus is like to have you come to their dormitories and train on campus. Um, next slide, please. Um, what does a guide dog do? Um, what does a guide dog do for its user? Okay, so the guide dog basically knows left, right, and forward and rest, at least in CNI, they teach it rest, not stay. I don't know why. Um, they, so it goes left, right, forward. So if I walk out of my house, um, you know, I'll cross this little tiny street because I live on a circle. I'll cross this little tiny street and walk out a little sidewalk. So, so that's just a forward. I just walk out. It's kind of hard now because I've done it so long. The dog knows what I'm going to do. But so you tell it, you know, it stops it. It should stop at the curb, the down curb before the street. We walk out the little sidewalk to the main street that we're going to walk down. Um, then um, it'll stop at the curb straight ahead and I'll t give it a hand motion and tell it right. And then it will turn to the right and walk me down that sidewalk and keep going until it hits a down curb and it'll stop at the down curb and I will say good girl forward and then we'll cross the street and she'll stop at the up curb um, and I will say good girl forward and I know that's an up curb I'll find it with my toe or whatever um, then we'll you know walk till we get to the place where I know I need to turn left to go over to the light rail station and so I'll say left and she will turn left and stop because there's a curb on our left. And I will say, good girl forward when the light changes and then she'll go across to the up curve and stop at the up curve and I'll say, good girl forward. And she goes up the up curve. So this is like basically your whole life is left, right and forward. And then once you get to the, of course, now that we do this every day, I don't do any of that because the dog pretty much knows where I wanted to go. Um, except for the down curves. I'm afraid of falling down down curves. So she always has to stop at down curves. Um, so basically dogs follow a line of travel. Um, they follow a sidewalk or a hallway. They stop at steps or obstacles like curbs. Um, if you're in a BART station or a mall or whatever, you can tell it, look for the uh, say escalator, escalator, find the escalator. Um, in the lobby of your you know, building going to work, you can tell it to look for the elevator. You do try and give it a hint where to go, like point to the left or 
and say Ele elevator left to the elevator to try and get it to go to the elevator. Like you don't want to tell it to go right if you know the elevator's on the left. But if you have no clue where you're going, then you just sort of have to explore and try and find the elevator, listen for the little bell to ring. Um, or if you have more vision, use the vision. You know, I, I guess it just depends on everybody's situation. But um, the dogs do know the word elevator and they can find them. It just, they have to, uh, you know, it's, um, it depends whether you know where you're going or not. If you've ever been there before, it helps. Um, it, it helps if you've been there before, because then obviously you know where you are. But um, if you're searching for it, then you um, tell the dog you look for the elevator and you just keep going forward and you work through it together as a team. Um, so the dog identifies steps, elevators, escalators, upon verbal command, um, intelligent disobedience. This is what's supposed to be different about guide dogs from other service dogs, is that um, my dog overrides my decision making. So particularly electric vehicles that I can't hear, especially if there's a lot of traffic noise. Um, a lot of electronic electric vehicles are silent. And so I could very easily tell my dog to go forward and walk right in front of a car and have no clue. Um, and so the dog is trained, this is something we practice in school, to actually um, reject my command and stay put. And when she does that, I have to tell her, you're a really good dog, you're good. And so, in fact, when, I'm, when I, I practice this on real cars that I can actually hear, not real, but cars that are not electric, that I can hear and I try to get her to walk out in front of them. And if she does walk out in front of them, I would correct the heck out of her. And if she doesn't, then I really praise her and tell her what a good girl she is for not walking out in front of a moving vehicle. Because of course she's just a dog. She doesn't really understand that if she walks in front of a moving vehicle, we're both kind of toast, right? So, um, but um, they train you in school and school we have, a, we have traffic checks and all the guide dog schools do this as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware of and you, they kind of pull out of driveways or pull out uh, and street crossings. It, and the whole point is to make sure your dog is watching for, um, for moving vehicles. Um, next slide, please. Um, so dogs learn to identify empty seats and buses, light rail, public places. Um, yeah, that's definitely something I feel like I've had to practice. I don't, I did something I have to practice. I, maybe other dogs are better at that than mine, um, but it's it's definitely practice. They um, uh, can learn to take you back to your seat in a restaurant or in a meeting or in class. Um, they're supposed to lie, uh, lay, lie, on, lie on the floor, lay on the floor in a train or airplane or when you're traveling in a car, not supposed to be on the seat. Um, they can find a counter in a coffee shop or in a store. They learn to work through revolving doors. Um, next slide, please. Um, they may learn to find a trash can or a ramp to light rail platform or stairs in a specific entrance. Um, I, Irish, that's not one of Irish's favorite things. I, I swear there's a... a a set of stairs I used to have to go to like once a week for, I don't know, like every third week. And I could never get her to find those stairs, even though I'd been in them multiple times. Um, it, it was the weirdest thing. I, I could never get her to do it. Yet my first dog, like if I went to an office or somewhere, like once, three years later, she would still show me that office or that building and be like, hey, we went there once. Do you want to go back? Uh, that is not Irish's forte. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> um, so the, they also learn appropriate behavior, like don't bark in public places, focus on work. They're supposed to sleep under the desk or in the bed in your office or sleep under a table or chair during meetings. Um, dogs don't read traffic light. It's up to the blind person to have the orientation and mobility training to know how to cross the street. Um, for me, that's a lot easier if I can hear the traffic. If there's no traffic, I don't really have a clue when to cross the street because I, I basically I listen to what the traffic is doing for my cues of when to cross. Um, so if there's no traffic, it's really hard for me to know. But in, if 
I used to have my friend who tell me all the time that my dog didn't know how to cross the street. And I was like, well, actually it was my fault, not the dogs, but I, I kept trying to tell them that, but at any rate, <laughs> it's, yeah, that was totally my fault. I, yeah, there was a street I used to cross all the time near work that there just wasn't always traffic. And so I was not sure when to cross the street. So I just did my best. Um, Let's see, the dog watches for moving cars and streets and driveways. They work in crowds. Oh, yeah, because my dog is from New Jersey. We worked in New York. We worked in Times Square. I had no clue where I was in Times Square. The sidewalks were huge. There were so many people. There were horse butts. There were like, I was so overwhelmed. I just kind of clung on to the harness and told her forward. And like, I can't tell you much about the rest of it. I was just so overwhelmed, um, but she did it. <laughs> We're both alive. Um, maintain a line of travel on roads where, oh yeah, we learned country travel. Um, you learn to maintain a line of travel, even on like si side sidewalkless roads. Um, that's another thing we learned how to travel. Um, yeah, it's called country travel and it's just where when there's no sidewalk or path they still have to learn to follow a road and keep going straight even when the like if there's a a left turn you know where the street turns they need to learn to go straight and treat it like there's a straight line and, and it's, it's something you work on so um next slide please um what does a guy dog do in the work Place. Okay, I'm checking my time because I'm rambling. Um, um, so in the workplace, we sort of talked about this. Um, so their harness is like their work clothes. When they're wearing their harness, they're supposed to know to act like a professional. I actually take my dog's harness off at, at work, but I do try to keep her in my office or under my desk. Although sometimes she did like to sleep outside the office and see people walking by. Um, she definitely liked, I think, because she would get attention. Um, they learn to sleep under the desk or um, chairs in a meeting. Um, don't bark inappropriately. Um, next slide, please. Um, once the harness comes off, so what does a dog do at home? Um, a guide dog at home. So once a harness comes off, the guide dog is just a dog. Um, they learn... They learn not to jump on people who come to the door. Um, that's something you definitely have to keep. We really practice it at school, um, but it's a lot easier at school because the trainer just comes into the room and if the dog jumps, they back out and they shut the door. And then they open the door and come back in. And if the dog jumps, they shut the door and go back out. So you can do that 10 times before the dog is like, you know what, I'm not gonna jump anymore. Cause this is like, what do I get out of it? Um, so then the dog gets bored and they don't jump anymore. Well, it's a lot harder when you're at home and you can't ask your friend or your, you know, elderly parents or whatever to just keep going back out and coming back in. So I, I guess, you know, I keep her on the leash and try to keep her from jumping on people when she walks in the door. You know, it's something when they're young, they get excited and they just do it and you try to um, correct them for doing it. Um, now she's old, so she doesn't do it, thankfully. <laughs> I guess that's a benefit of age. Um, guide dogs learn not to counter surf. That I think that's one of those things that, uh, you know, you, you don't want to set it up for failure either. Like you don't set a, um, a stake on the counter and think you're going to walk away and come back and have it still there. At least I wouldn't. Um, I, we don't really have meat in my house, but she did steal a burrito once. So, and actually she... When our trainer was visiting, she did steal a bag of Reese's cups and eat most of it. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, I don't know. <laughs> They're dogs. Um, guide dogs learn not to sleep on furniture. That's true. And that's another thing you keep up. Um, guide dog users maintain training. Yeah. So that's just a reminder that it's really up to us as users to maintain their training, not to sleep on the furniture, not to counter surf. Uh, not to jump on people when they come to the door, not to jump on people in the office. Um, next slide, please. Um, barriers faced by guide dog users. Okay, so um, so this is interesting. People petting or making eye contact with guide dogs is distracting to the dog, even 
making eye contact with a dog can distract it from doing its work. So I hear a lot of people, I know a lot of guide dog users really feel that their dog gets distracted. I think maybe the cuter or sweeter, like golden or lab or whatever, um, you probably get a lot more of this than I do. I think because I have a shepherd, I don't get a whole bunch of it. My dog is always begging people to pet her and really sad when people don't pet her. And I just don't, <laughs> I don't have this much of a problem, but, um, but I don't doubt that other people do. I've seen it. Um, I had a friend with a golden retriever who, uh, we got, we tried to go to the farmer's market and we couldn't get two steps without people stopping and, or, or tra traipsing up to it with like, you know, just a bunch of people in tow to pet him. And so I understand it. I just, I haven't experienced it personally. And so I, it doesn't, I guess it depends on the user, but I, I definitely hear that all the time um, that people really don't like. And I think a lot of the schools say, don't, you know, do what's comfortable for you. But generally the rule is not to pet service dogs because um, it can distract them from working. Um, the Centers for Disease Control Prevention regulations that came out August 1st um, requires a CDC form to be filled out for all dog handlers, including service animals, to complete when they come back into the country. It has to do with rabies, high and low risk countries. There are high and low risk rabies um, countries. And um, I put the website here. The whole reason this is a barrier as the, the form right now is inaccessible. So my understanding is that the guide dog schools and National Federation of the Blind are working with the CDC and the platform on which the form was created to make it accessible. Um, there's also a Department of Transportation form that we've had to fill out since 2020. It's a behavior and health certificate form. And I think if you're flying over eight hours, you have to say that your dog is not gonna to go to the bathroom on the plane. Um, you have to fill it out, I believe within 48 hours of your flight. So the problem with it again is at least the one, so, so Department of Transportation says it's up to the airlines to make it accessible. The ones I have found, I could not found, fill out. Like I could read some of it, but like I could tell I wasn't reading it right because it asked for my name and then it asked for my guide dog's phone. It asked for my name and mobile number and then it asked for my guide dog's mobile number. And once I got there, I was like, okay, this clearly isn't reading right. So I had someone cited fill it out for me. And um, that is definitely not what it said. And so basically I just, I just keep, up, I change the date on the form and I just keep using the same form over and over. And I just change the date every time I fly. Um, so the way it becomes a barrier is if you don't have someone to help you fill out a form or if you have to fill out the form at the last minute, you have to fly suddenly, or if you show up at the airport not knowing that you're gonna have to fill out a form um, and you can't fill it out yourself, right? Cause you can't see it. Um, so I guess it's just um, a, a, a barrier. It's just a barrier that um, I don't know if they've made it accessible yet, but the last time I tried to fill it out, I wasn't able to. Um, but once you know about it and um, fill it out once, you really just have to change the date um, and keep submitting it. Um, next slide, please. Um, every time you fly, you just, you know, just change the date and resubmit the form. Um, what else about this? Oh, I think also this form, um, it also requires the air, the uh, Department of, let's see, where is this? The form asks if your dog is under 65 pounds. If it is, if your dog is over 65 pounds, I'm trying to figure out where this requirement comes from, if this is on the form or if this is from a regulation, and I can't really tell from my notes, but if your dog is under 65 pounds, then there's no problem. If it is over 65 pounds, then they can actually tell you to go on a different flight if they don't feel like they can fit your dog. So that's another issue because a lot of guide dogs aren't um, under 65 pounds, mine included. <laughs> um, but I have never, in, in all fairness, I have never been asked to take a different flight. Um, some airlines are also using a third party to validate whether um, dogs are legitimate service animals. 
And I have seen um, stuff on Facebook, even from people at the scene who went to the same guide dog school as I do, so I know they're blind, um, who said they were denied and they, uh, the entity, I think it's, I think it's called Blue Door, um, says their dog is not a legitimate service animal and they won't tell you why. So you can't really do anything to fix it immediately. You can't adjust whatever their issue is, you can't address it. And um, so then you just basically have to file a, a, a report with the Department of Justice and file a complaint um, with the EEOC. And um, that is, um, and then I also provided an article, I think this talks about the issues caused by the um, forms. So next slide, please. Um, so bar barriers faced by guide dog users, um, law, law enforcement. So there are law provisions I'll briefly brush over, but a lot of times law enforcement aren't aware of those codes or um, are unwilling to force them. Um, I, I've, you know, again, I've um, just in, in my position as a president of the Guide Dog Association, I also, I often get reports from people looking for help or complaints from people looking for help. And I've had people say that, you know, they couldn't get into a restaurant and the police were just like, oh, well, you know, they have the right to not let people in. And it's sort of not true if the reason they're not letting you in is because you have a guide dog. Um, so there's, um, what are other issues? And Uber and Lyft denials, a lot of people get ride share denials. Um, they're starting to try and enforce that with the penal code, or I've heard of uh, um, situations where they're trying to enforce that with the penal code. So um, that might that might help that um, stop for occurring, but we've been fighting that fight for like 10 years. Well, ever since Uber and Lyft came on the scene, um, we've been fighting with um, them denying rides to guide dog users. Um, there's also a lot of confusion in businesses and um, housing about the difference between guide dogs or, or, or service dogs and emotional support animals. Um, so um, emotional support animals are allowed to be in housing, whereas businesses don't have to uh, permit um, uh, emotional support animals. They're required to permit, um, public places are required to permit um, the, um, service dogs, but not the emotional support animals. That's not the same for housing though. Housing has to uh, allow, or, or they do permit emotional support animals. I'm sure there are circumstances under which they don't have to, but um, generally speaking, they do permit uh, emotional support animals and service dogs. Um, I've also experienced confusion. I've actually experienced this and heard of other people experiencing it where um, people are so used to seeing a vest that they don't recognize the harness on a guide dog as um, they're like, well, what if your dog is a service dog, why isn't wearing a vest? And so you kind of have to work through them that because it's a guide dog, you need the harness so the dog can guide you and the vest wouldn't help with that. And um, Or uh, sometimes people have bad experiences with dogs because people have gotten a vest off the internet and put it on their dog and then the dog behaves very badly. So you'll come into a business and they'll say, you know, the last time a service dog was in here, it behaved really badly. And um, that's why we don't want to let you in here again. And you know, it's hard to know whether that was a legitimate service dog or not, but given that anyone can pretty much get a vest on the internet now and smack it on any old dog that has no training, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know, right? Um, also attacks on guide dogs or interference with guide dogs. Um, most people I know have had their guide dog Definitely interfere, interfered with by other guide uh, by other dogs where the dogs are barking or lunging at them, and it's hard for the dog to stay focused on getting its um, user somewhere safely. To, to outright attacks, I've definitely known a number of attacks, and my first guide dog was attacked at the San Diego airport. And um, you know, again, it's like how fast can you get law enforcement there, and do they talk to witnesses and? Um, could they see anything on camera? So it can be really hard to do much about it. Um, 
uh, depending on the circumstances. You know, now everyone can wear these glasses with cameras and I, I really coach people, you know, wear the glasses with cameras and try to remember when something happens, turn that camera on. Um, a camera can really be your best friend um, when you're in a situation uh, like that. Um, and then I say, oh, and then keeping dogs from uh, keeping a guide dog from eating stuff off the ground in an airport, right? Like, because you want your dog to not have any accidents on the plane, and <laughs> that's part of a uh, much much easier to remedy. But yeah, you got to keep your dog from eating random stuff off the ground in the airport. Um, ride share denials. We talked about sales of service dog equipment online makes it easy for anyone to go get a vest and put it on their dog. And again, that, the only real problem with that is just that if the dog doesn't behave well, then it sort of makes service dog, you know, makes businesses and other people not trust what a service dog is supposed to be. Um, and then on Facebook, you can easily find an uh, entity that says it'll certify your dog as a service dog in three easy steps. So that's the same issue. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so legal protections. I realize I didn't list them all, but Americans with Disabilities Act um, under the ADA states, local governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations that serve pub public generally have to allow um, service animals to accompany people with disabilities in all areas where the public is allowed to go. Um, I um, put the link on there. Then there's California penal code sections about preventing interference or harassment, um, preventing, um, you know, making it uh, fraudulent, uh, making it, a, a, I think it's a misdemeanor to knowingly or fraudulently misrepresent your dog as a, as a service dog. Um, the California Civil Code also gives uh, the guide dog uh, you right to go you right to go places in public with your guide dog. Um, and then I didn't put on the Fair Employment and Housing Act, which provides the housing rights for guide dogs um, and uh, ESAs, uh, emotional support animals. Next slide, please. And um, let's see. What can businesses ask? So here are the questions businesses can ask. When it's not obvious what service a dog provides, a business or staff can ask these two questions. Um, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And what work or tack has the dog been trained to perform? Next slide, please. And then what are the responsibilities of the guide dog owner? I think we've gone through these. So sorry about the repetition. You keep it healthy, take it to the vet. You relieve it on a regular schedule to try and prevent accidents. Um, you keep the guide dog from eating food it shouldn't eat. Um, so it relieves appropriately. You feed the guide dog on a schedule to help it relieve again appropriately, regularly. Um, you groom it to reduce shedding. You don't want it to stink. You don't want it to shed. Uh, you correct the guide dog immediately when it behaves inappropriately. Um, and you praise it for good work. Um, you practice obedience. And you teach um, family and other people how to behave around the guide dog. You don't let people food it, feed it from the table. Next slide, please. And um, yeah, that's it. Phew, I made it through. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, I will totally be happy to take questions. Hi, great presentation, and thank you for bringing your dog with you as well today. Um, the question I had was, uh, is there any moments when your dog barks? Like if there's danger, like does that signal you, or is it never going to bark when it's actually working or professional? I think, you know, if a dog occasionally barks just for some random reason, you know, she gets, you know, as long as it's not um, a continual, like, 
out of control barking, you stop it. Um, it's not part of her training to bark. So she, you know, at least as, as far as I'm aware, I don't think it's, you know, guide dogs aren't like trained to bark for specific things. Um, I think as you get to know your dog, it may bark at certain things. Certainly at home, I don't care whether she barks, she's out of harness, she's just a dog. Um, and um, I, I'm happy if she barks because it makes me just feel safer. I want people to know I have a big scary dog at home, um, even though she's totally not scary. But um, I don't think as part of her training, she barks. So I don't, I'm not sure I can think of a situation where she would do it. I, I would be, I would really be surprised if she barked. If, if she barked, it would probably be out of um, surprise or something. Yeah. Any other questions, Arma? All right. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. And I missed the very first beginning of it because I had a meeting. So uh, apologies if you already went over this, but what's your biggest pet peeve um, in terms of how people interact with you or interact with your guide dog when you're working together? Oh, wow. Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, the only, I guess, um, uh, probably the hardest thing for me to deal with is when I, um, walk past, walk past other dogs and the, um, and the, the dog we have to walk past is barking or growling and I can't tell how like I used to um I used to have to walk past it, it, there was this really narrow sidewalk and I'd have to walk and, and there were tables and chairs on the sidewalk and there was barely any space for us to squeeze by and often people would sit there and often they had dogs with them that did not sound very friendly and I think that was like this really scary because I couldn't really step into the street because it was a busy street um and I but I would have to walk by there like I would have to squeeze by these tables and chairs and I think that's really the scariest thing just because you really don't know, am I going to get bitten? Is my dog going to get bitten? So actually it was really nice when people in that situation would be like, I have my dog. You're good. You're good. You know, sorry, she's barking, but I have my dog. I I have her, you know, she can't get to you or whatever. Um, Cause I, I think that's really the scariest thing. You're like, is my dog in danger? Am I in danger? Um, I think for me, that's my biggest frustration. Thanks. Any other questions? I know there's one on the chat I saw pop up. <laughs> I did have a quick question, Shannon. You mentioned that some um, guide dog users have like a particular preference for a breed. I noticed Irish is a German Shepherd. Is German Shepherd your particular breed? And what breed did you have prior to Irish? Thanks. Um, yeah, my I I do prefer Shepherds. No particular reason. I just like Shepherds. And um, she, um, my first one was a German Shepherd as well. Um, but I know there are schools that do labs and goldens and they do yellow labs and black labs. And I think there's a school that does boxers um, in Michigan. I believe the school in Michigan does boxers. And, um, um, and, then, and then I think there's another school that gets dogs from shelters and tries to, or uh, they rescue dogs. I don't know if they're from shelters, but they rescue dogs and try to use those dogs. So they aren't any particular breed. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I, I've always had shepherds. <laughs> and uh, Nick in the chat said, thank you for presenting today. Thank you. So thank you for any me. other questions from the folks in the audience or on Zoom? I'm not seeing any. Going once, going twice. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Oh, Jess, Jess has one. Um, so I thought your presentation was super helpful because you brought up a lot of things that probably most people don't think of. Like everyone knows that the dog's trained, but probably a lot of people don't realize that you actually have to be trained to work with the dog. So I thought that was super insightful and helpful and informational. But um, is there a cost to be matched with the dog? Did you have to pay anything or how is that funded? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that's an awesome question. Thanks. I think... 
Um, so I, I think, I don't know what all schools do. I know my school, I have to pay, uh, I had to pay a fee of seriously only $150, which is like nothing if you consider that I go there, you know, for two to three weeks and get a, a dog, like I get a, a dog, like that's a bred dog, a dog that's been trained and bred for over a year and a half. Um, so all I had to pay was $150 for her. Um, some schools pay the vet fees and um, pay the vet fees and everything for your dog. Um, the, my school doesn't pay for your vet fees, but they will give you a no interest loan to help you with the vet expenses if you need help. Um, and I don't know if all schools charge a fee for your dog or not. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any in the chat. Artemio, let me get back there. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. Uh, quick question. What can the public do um, and we um, can do to help support service animals and, and dogs that help? I imagine that there might be ways that we can contribute even monetarily through supporting the nonprofit organizations that um, help train these dogs? What, what are some of the things that the public can do to, to support um, these programs to continue to provide these services? Oh, wow, thanks for asking. Um, so there's, you know, like 15 different guide dog programs who, um, you know, I, I know in California, there's guide dogs for the blind and there's guide dogs of America down in LA, guide dogs for the blind is in San Rafael. The CNI is in New Jersey, um, and they all are not-for-profit organizations, so they all take, you know, they all definitely take funding, um, you know, either through their webpage or during the year, during, like, they'll have auctions or stuff like that to raise money and have different fundraisers. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a, that's an awesome way to help, help with these, um, programs to continue because they really they're huge um, obviously for those of us with guide dogs I just talked to Jess and we're going to do a little research and try to find some of those organizations and we can share that information with the department and the people that are here from other departments um, online also you can uh, donate through United Way also when we do that campaign annually and I don't see any other questions. You guys keep making me do the countdown and there's always one more question. Any more questions? Huh? Oh, oh that was fine. I can tell you what I know. I know that miniature horses, the questions about miniature horses, and I know that miniature horses are actually also, they are the other service animal. You know, I think it was in 2010, um, it, the service animals used to be a really broad under the ADA. And then in 2010 or 2011, they made it um, only applicable to dogs and in some cases, miniature horses. And I am not clear where miniature horses, because I think their rights are a little bit more abridged than um, guide dogs. Like, I don't, I don't know if I would have the right to bring a miniature dog to, um, you know, a, uh, a, uh, building, you know, a state building for work, right? I don't know if that would be permitted because um, I, I don't know that you can have them inside. I don't know that that works, but um, but um, I know I've heard that they do fly on planes and the advantage to the miniature horses is that they work for like 30 years. You know, a guide dog only works like eight to 10 years, right? But like a miniature horse, because they have such a better lifespan can work a lot longer. Um, so, so I can definitely see the advantage empirically. I've kind of heard that because they have to wear a, a kind of a, a diaper to, um, to maintain, you know, their droppings because they don't really go on command, I guess. Um, this is just what I heard. So this, I'm like not that educated about it. That, so that, that can be a, a kind of an issue. Um, but it's, it's not like they, you know, relieve. So the relief, you, you, it's caught in a bag, but it, it still has an odor. Um, 
So, but I've heard that they're actually really great. I, and I just don't think they're as common because they don't, they don't fit in places, you know, they're bigger than dogs. So they don't quite as easily fit places. All right. I think we're a little over time, but that's okay. Well, thank you everybody for being here today, Shannon. Thank you for coming and presenting to us again. Um, glad to have you back. Um, I want to remind everybody that next week we have canine companions that'll be present. Um, and then the week after the Sacramento SPCA will be here with their love on loan program. Um, and we are still doing our, um, uh, donation drive for the SPCA. So please check your emails for that information on where you can drop off supplies uh, to be donated to the SPCA. And with that, uh, we will end the, the event. Thank everybody for being here. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure.